Hi, my name is Vacheslav Yonkov, and I'm going to talk about the DNA codec that we uh, created at Los Alamos National Lab. So this work is part of uh, a YARPAS MIST project that uh, uh, has a goal of uh, leapfrogging all the uh, technologies uh, that uh, can be used to do uh, storage of data in DNA. And uh, the Los Alamos National Lab was uh, chosen to be a test and evaluation partner for IARPA for this project. So uh, we had to be able to evaluate the uh, performance, the performance of uh, the participants in this uh, program. And since uh, the um, goal of the program is to uh, improve the, all the technologies a lot, we uh, had to be able to uh, evaluate uh, vastly different uh, technology parameters from the start, from the first mi milestone of the program to the last one. So we had to create some uh, uh, a codec to encode the data that is very adaptable and very flexible to the changing technologies. Um, so um, the goals that we set up for ourselves when we started designing the codec were to provide high bit density as much as possible, to, to encode as much data as possible in DNA, to adapt to the uh, oligos of different lengths, lengths since uh, right now uh, the length of the oligos that can be synthesized uh, is one of the main restrictions of the technologies um, and to adapt to different errors, different error types, error rates for different types, uh, spatial distribution of errors and uh, uh, complete uh, Oligos missing from uh, when we read the data. So since this uh, talk is part of a larger session on DNA storage, I'm not going to spend too much time talking about what DNA is and uh, uh, hopefully uh, you uh, somebody will do a better job than me since I'm a computer scientist. But um, I'm going to uh, spend some time to give you uh, DNA 101 uh, overview. So DNA molecules are complex uh, organic polymers. They consist of sequences of uh, A, C, T, and G nucleotides. And uh, the DNA molecules can be single or double-stranded. And they're very stable. If life allows, uh, they can last tens or even hundreds of years. So not all um, nucleotides that can be present in DNA are equal. Some of them um, pose more challenges to the processes than others. For example, the, the G um, nucleotide changes the physical properties of the molecules. So they uh, change their shape in the 3D space, and uh, also it changes the melting temperature of the DNA molecules, so it makes uh, sequencing and synthesis uh, harder. Uh, so there are three main uh, processes that uh, are going to be used for storing uh, data in DNA, synthesis, amplification, and sequencing. Synthesis is uh, creating a DNA molecule from scratch, and uh, it's uncommon in nature. Most of the bi biological processes uh, actually uh, work on already existing DNA molecules. All the enzymes uh, can work on uh, copying uh, parts of the existing D uh, DNA molecules. So uh, this is the process that is the least developed right now. Um, it works uh, by appending a single nucleotide at one of the ends of the DNA molecule. And since, since it uh, requires uh, multiple chemical 
steps, it can take minutes per nucleotide to be added at the end. The second process is uh, amplification, uh, the PCR uh, that we all have heard in the re recent years. It's very common in nature. It creates copies of uh, existing molecules. It, and it's extremely cheap and in my opinion, it's one of the biggest advantages of storing data in DNA uh, since uh, uh, creating copies of terabytes of uh, data can cost uh, like a few dollars. Uh, the third process is sequencing or reading the data. Uh, if you have a pool of uh, DNA molecules, you can uh, read uh, what each of them, uh, well, uh, you can read uh, the content of these molecules, the A's, C's, and T's, and G's. It's uh, usually the, the most common uh, techniques uh, use PCR again, and there are some new newer technologies that use uh, nanopore. Um, so since there are billions and trillions of uh, molecules in the liquid uh, pool. Uh, the only way to ensure that we read most of them is to read multiples of each of the unique molecules. So each sequence is sequenced more than one time, which is the read depth. Um, in most cases, uh, in uh, most common cases, uh, the read depth is between six and 20, which means that each unique sequence is uh, um, sequenced six to 20 times. So all these processes are very slow. And uh, in order to have uh, a reasonable use for data storage, they need to be done at extreme scale and uh, at for millions of molecules in parallel. And uh, that's what uh, the performers that uh, are part of the MIST program are trying to do. So um, storing data in DNA molecules has some unique challenges. Um, that are not uh, um, common in uh, other storage uh, technologies. One of the problem, uh, one of the things is that uh, uh, the syn synthesis technologies that uh, currently exist can only synthesize very short sequences of 100 to 300 nucleotides. Um, even at the theoretical maximum of two bits per nucleotide, that uh, uh, equals something like 60 bytes per DNA molecule, which is not much. Uh, another, uh, chal another challenge, another difference with DNA storage is that all the molecules are mixed together. So it's not like on the hard drive, you have sectors that are ordered, uh, and tracks that are ordered and basically you know where to go to read track 17 for example uh, the dna molecules are all mixed together so each of them needs to have some way of identifying itself so some of the nucleotides in these molecules have to be used to store some kind of address that distinguishes the molecule from all other molecules. And that decreases the amount of nucleotides that are available to store the actual data even further. A very big challenge is the very high error rates that uh, the current technologies have uh, from 0.3 to 20% per nucleotide per position in the oligo. So imagine that you have a hard drive that uh, has a chance of 20% bit flip for every bit that is stored on the, this drive. It's going to be pretty hard to store and recover any data um, with uh, uh, that 
such high error rate. So it's a, it is a very big challenge. Then there are some there are some restrictions that we call structural structural oligo restrictions. Uh, for example, it is very hard to synthesize and to sequence um, molecules that are all of the same type of nucleotide. For example, uh, oligo that has a a a a a a a a a a is really hard to to work with. Um, and uh, another uh, problematic structural uh, restriction is the CG content. As I, as I said earlier, the G nucleotide is very uh, special and it, it uh, makes it harder. Like if, if we have too many of the nucleotides of the type G, that makes it harder to work with the DNA molecule too. Since we're using three um, uh, processes for uh, storage, we have three independent uh, sources of errors uh, during the synthesis, the amplification, and the sequencing. And they all have uh, these three types of errors, substitution, division, and insertion. Um, there is a... Uh, uh, the substitution is common for other DNA uh, for other uh, storage uh, technologies. It's like the bit flip. You write one and you read zero. But insertion and deletion are very unique for um, DNA. When when you synthesize um, the uh, uh, adding uh, a nucleotide can not happen or you can add multiple nucleotides when you think that you're adding a single one. And the same for uh, deletion. Um, and this process happens not only during the synthesis, but also during the amplification and the sequencing. So um, the, the, the deletion and the insertion errors uh, make it uh, impractical to use error correction codes that are uh, commonly used for other data storages. So when we started the design of our codec, we uh, first started with uh, asking how to encode as many bits as possible per nucleotide, given that we have to deal with uh, the structural errors. Uh, the theoretical maximum is two bits per nucleotide if we don't have, if we don't want to exclude any of these structural errors, but if we do, how do we approach the problem? The existing methods that uh, uh, were in literature uh, were had a bit density of 1.58 to 1.98 bits per nucleotide. So the way that we approached the problem was uh, by ordering all the oligos of certain land and uh, excluding the sequences that don't match the uh, structural restriction criteria. So for example, uh, if we want to exclude all homopolymers that are with length higher than four, for example, if you have five A's in a row, we want to exclude that. We exclude all the uh, sequences of that type and we assign numerical values to the uh, remaining uh, oligos. The example that I show here in uh, uh, sequences of length of uh, five, we can store up to 981 values. Uh, the, the diagram, so we run this, uh, sim, uh, this uh, oligo counting algorithm for different uh, uh, lengths of uh, oligos and uh, different uh, criteria for rejection. And uh, the red line shows uh, the restriction HP4, which means no more than four uh, nucleotides of the same type in sequence. And you can see that uh, going up to a thousand uh, nucleotides per oligo, it gets very close to a bit density of uh, two bits per uh, nucleotide. And if you 
I look at the purple line, which is uh, only uh, you can't have any homopolymers. So if you have an A, the next uh, nucleotide can be only T, C, or G. Uh, the data density uh, ceiling is something like 1.6 bits per nucleotide. So we split uh, the algorithms that we use for our codec in three parts. The level zero is bit packing, how to convert between bits and nucleotides. The level two is uh, how do you store, how do you uh, format a single oligo and what kind of uh, information you need to store, to store in it in order to recover anything. And the level two is uh, error correction with uh, multiple oligos and how do you uh, store a file of variable size into a pool of uh, DNA molecules. So um, at level one, in addition to the actual data payload that we want to store, we, are, we need to store some oligo identification plus uh, some way of uh, checking if the oligo identification is we sequenced it we read it correctly at level two we uh, um, store additional data that we can use to recover recover errors in the data parts of the single oligo layout so at level one uh, at level zero we uh, use uh, the oligo counting algorithm that uh, I described earlier. We have the, rest the restriction that we use is H4G2, which is maximum of four uh, of the same for A, T, and C, and maximum of two for G, since G is special. We have some, uh, the high CG content is handled at the level uh, one. And uh, since it takes exponentially longer time to uh, do the oligo counting, we limit uh, the, the size of a fragment that we encode at a time to 16 nucleotides. In 16 nucleotides, we can store 33 bits of data, which gives us a data density of 1.94 bits per nucleotide at level zero. So, uh, if we want to construct uh, oligos longer than 16 nucleotides, we just uh, split the, the values that we want to store. We encode them in up to 16 nucleotides of fragments, and then we append these uh, uh, fragments uh, at the end of the already existing oligo. We, we have a way to ensure that uh, the homopolymer restrictions uh, are still preserved when we append at the end. At level one, uh, we define uh, the single oligo layout. We split the data that we want to store in a, a single oligo into data blocks. Each data block is 33 bit of size, 32 bit of data plus one bit of parity. Uh, the metadata with that we need to store is uh, we have a flag for high CG content. We have a flag that we use at level two to uh, define if the oligo contains data or erasure code. And the rest of the metadata is the address and it's a, param a parameter that our codec has. We distribute the metadata into Basically, we split the metadata into as many blocks as we have uh, data blocks, and we place it between the data blocks. Uh, we use this uh, to be able to do data alignment and recover from insertions and uh, deletions. Um, some of the metadata blocks uh, contain CRC or uh, read Solomon error detection codes that we can used to ensure that we uh, recover the metadata correctly. So this shows, this slide shows how uh, the, an, a single oligo looks like. It starts with data block zero, then the metadata block zero, and so forth. 
each of the, uh, the data blocks is uh, 33 bits long. The metadata is split into n minus three um, metadata blocks. And then we calculate uh, one or two uh, metadata blocks with uh, a checksum, some kind of error detection algorithm. Uh, this slide uh, explains how we do this uh, block alignment to uh, discover insertion and deletion errors. I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but uh, uh, it uh, basically tries to shift the, the beginning of the metadata blocks uh, left or right and try to calculate the checksums to um, find out uh, uh, if uh, the checksums match the, date, the metadata that we recovered. And since uh, the checksums are not very long, uh, we may have a lot of false positives and uh, we deal with that uh, at the next level. Um, so the level two of our codec uh, introduces erasure coding, it combines, uh, it groups a uh, uh, number of oligos together and it uh, calculates erasure codes for the data blocks from the different oligos. So in case uh, some of the uh, data blocks are decoded uh, with errors or in case they're missing oligos, we can recover the data uh, from the erasure oligos. Um, so we, uh, since, uh, there is uh, evidence that uh, the errors are not evenly spatially distributed uh, and th there are more errors at the beginning and at the end of the uh, molecules. We use this uh, diagonal uh, technique to try to uh, correct for this spatial bias, a bias of errors. Um, yeah, that's about it for level two. I'm going to uh, quickly show you some examples of different uh, parameters for the codec and how much data and what density we um, can get from it. If we have uh, oligos of 107 nucleotides of length, we can store five data blocks, which is like 20 bytes of data, uh, which is uh, um, 1.94 bits per nucleotide at that point, at that uh, level. Uh, we can uh, have uh, about 1.6 million unique oligos, which is about 30 megabytes of data total. At uh, the total level, at level two, uh, the bit density is about one bit per nucleotide. If we add three more nucleotides to an oligo and we use 110 nucleotide oligos, uh, we can uh, have 98 uh, million uh, unique oligos, which is 1.8 gigabytes of data. And uh, the bit density goes down a little bit to 0 0.97 bits per nucleotide. If we store data in 204 nucleotide oligos, um, we can uh, store 216 terabytes of data and the bit density goes a little bit up, a little bit more than one bit per nucleotide. So the, the, the longer the oligos are, the more uh, data you can store and the bit density goes up. So we did some simulations to find out what, uh, how resilient our codec is uh, for, er uh, for errors. And uh, this show, these two graphs show the uh, error rates uh, for different uh, uh, probabilities for errors per position. Um, so the first graph shows uh, the error rates uh, if we use only one metadata block for error detection, and the 
thickness of the line shows the false positives. So you can see that uh, the if we use one metadata block for error detection, the false positives are pretty high and uh, uh, using two metadata blocks decreases it uh, drastically. Um, it also shows that uh, at level one, uh, the error rate goes up uh, a lot uh, when the error uh, the errors uh, in for synthesis and uh, sequencing go up and like uh, it's almost in, impossible to recover any data at uh, if you have a probability of four errors at five percent per position I imagine like if you have uh, uh, an oligo of uh, 100 nucleotides and you have a uh, 5% chance of each of these nucleotides to be wrong, uh, that um, ensures that you have uh, multiple errors in each of the oligos. These graphs show uh, how a level two uh, helps to decrease the error, the error rates from level one. And uh, it shows the, uh, how much data we can recover from, um, uh, from the pool. So uh, the verified rate of one means we recover all the data and verified rate of zero shows that we uh, can't recover any data. The first graph uh, on the left uh, bottom side of the, uh, of the slide shows uh, how much data we can recover depending on the read depth. The read depth is how many times we try to sequence each unique oligo. Uh, so you can see that uh, if we have a, only a single uh, depth of uh, one, uh, basically, you can recover any uh, reasonable amount of data because uh, statistically it's almost impossible to read all the sequences if uh, um, the, you read only as many sequences as you try to write. And uh, it shows that uh, increasing the read depth uh, improves the performance and uh, increases the chance of uh, recovering the data. The second graph, the one on the top left, uh, top right uh, corner, shows how the um, re uh, recovery rate uh, varies depending on how big the erasure group is. Basically. We keep the uh, data to erasure uh, oligos the same, and uh, we just increase the erasure group. So we have, in, in the first case, the purple line is uh, we have uh, four data oligos and one erasure oligo. In the second one is uh, uh, the, the one that is 10 is uh, 8 to 2, um, 12 to 3, etc. So you can see that uh, surprisingly, uh, as the error probability of error increases, the erasure groups that are with the smallest size perform much better than the ones with uh, with a higher um, erasure group size. Um, yeah, that was something that we didn't actually expect. Uh, and the last graph shows uh, how the probability of re uh, the recovery uh, changes depending on how many erasure oligos we have. Uh, so uh, we have the, uh, the, the number of uh, data oligos in an erasure group set to 12, and we increase the number of uh, uh, erasure oligos from 1 to 12 and you can see that uh, the higher the, uh, that there is also like uh, um, some sweet spot of number of erasure oligos that uh, uh, 
recovers the most data. It's not more erasure oligos you add, more data you can recover, especially for very high uh, amount of errors. So after that, we actually encoded uh, the image on the right side of the slide into actual DNA molecules and uh, synthesize them and we sequence them and uh, we with uh, different uh, te uh, technologies and different uh, number of uh, sequencing techniques. So we stored uh, 800 kilobytes of data into approximately 100 oligos and uh, we were able to recover all the data in all the cases that we uh, tried to sequence the, the, the DNA pools. Uh, since our read that was uh, pretty high, we uh, wanted to see how much, like at, at what read depths we can still recover all the data. So we downsampled the, uh, the data for the different uh, sequences and uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the different uh, sequencing uh, uh, attempts. And uh, we saw that we can recover all the data uh, with three depths from four to eight, depending on uh, the different sequencing uh, uh, attempts. And uh, then we tried to see at what, what is the maximum depth that we can have and still not be able to recover all the data. So you can see that uh, at depths four to six, depending on uh, the attempts, uh, you no longer can uh, recover all the data from that uh, you uh, stored. And uh, there are some, there are a lot of numbers that I'm not going to go over uh, for the lack of time. Um, so the conclusions are that um, we created uh, a codec that has an adaptive uh, data packing and can use any oligo acceptance criteria as long as it has a reasonable locality. We demonstrated good data density with the homopolymer restrictions. Uh, we create uh, our codec works uh, well with different oligo lengths. It detects uh, deletions and insertions, and it can align the data and the metadata blocks. We used a novel 3D erasure coding that corrects for spatial error bias and allows uh, multiple uh, erasure oligos. And um, that's about it. If you have any questions, you can uh, email me or you can email me and uh, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you for your time.